Nafis Masdek Ahmed is Executive Director of the Institute for Policy Research and Development in Brighton, England, and is the best-selling author of The War on Freedom, How and Why America Was Attacked September 11, 2001. This book won him the Naples Prize, which is Italy's most prestigious literary award. His work has been praised by the eminent scholar and historian Gore Vidal. His latest book, previous to the current one he'll be discussing today, is Behind the War on Terror, Western Secret Strategy, and the Struggle for Iraq. Nafis is a doctoral candidate at the University of Sussex. So, I present you Nafis Ahmed. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, to be talking in front of you and to be talking about such an important issue, the connection between 9-11, deception, and the wars that are going on today in our name. So I'll be talking about the research that I've done in my new book, The War on Truth, and trying to explain to you some of the very important issues that I've come across that really call into question the conventional story of what happened on 9-11, and in turn, of course, call into question this entire war on terror that is now being conducted in our name. I'll begin with a statement that I found. I was doing research into the background of 9-11 and terrorism, and I found a book by um, a well-known Swiss TV journalist by the name of Richard Le Bivier called Dollars for Terror. One thing struck me, I mean, it's a very good book, but one statement struck me. He interviewed a CIA analyst anonymously who said to him, regarding the whole policy towards al-Qaeda and uh, Islam. He said, quote, the policy of guiding the evolution of Islam and of helping them against our adversaries worked marvelously well in Afghanistan against the Red Army. The same doctrines can still be used to destabilize what remains of Russian power and especially to counter the Chinese influence in Central Asia. Now, when I read this, I was quite shocked because really what it seemed to be saying was that there was, there was some kind of strategic thinking when we got involved with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan to repel the Soviet Union. There was some kind of thinking that maybe we could actually use these guys in a wider context. Even if it wasn't well thought out, it was something that struck me as very, very significant. And I thought, how do we find out whether this is true? So what I set out to do I said, so what are these key regions I can look at to see whether this is true? You know, Russian power and Chinese power. So we can look at Eastern Europe, the Balkans, and Central Asia, and Asia. So that's what I did. And I discovered, to my great surprise, that there was a lot of disturbing evidence that the United States, and not just the United States, Britain and various Western European powers as well, had been to this day connecting themselves in some way or other, with the Mujahideen, with Al-Qaeda, in various different regions for various different interests. I looked at Al-Qaeda in the Balkans, in North Africa, in the Asia Pacific, in the Caucasus and in the Middle East. And I would just want, want to try and give you a very brief breakdown of some of the kind of interesting pieces of evidence I found for this connection. The most prominent one, I think, to my mind, is the Balkans. We are told that we disconnected ourselves from the Mujahideen completely when the Soviet Union collapsed. This is just not true. It's well documented now that in the first Bosnian conflict between 1992 and 94, the Pentagon created an air funnel. They flew in Mujahideen, connected to Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda from many different parts of the world. Central Asia, the Middle East, and flew them in. They landed in Bosnia in various places, and they used them to try and manipulate the Bosnian conflict in a certain direction. Whatever one may think of our motive for getting involved in the Bosnian conflict, whether it was humanitarian or not, is besides the point. In doing so, we connected ourselves with people who are connected to terrorism, and subsequently, as a result of that, Bosnia has been described as a safe haven for terrorists in Europe, a launching pad for European terrorist operations. 
just to give you an idea of the documentation that is available, this was confirmed, this, the existence of this liaison between the United States and Britain and the Mujahideen. Um, one of the most prominent sources was the Dutch report into what happened at Srebrenica, um, the official inquiry that happened a few years ago. And that was based on Dutch intelligence sources. But it's been confirmed by many other sources. There are many reports in, in British newspapers. The London Spectator, for example, um, Yusuf Bedansky, the congressional director, the director of, uh, of the Congressional Task Force on Terrorism, has talked about this. Many other, many other people have talked about it. And we didn't just stop then. In the Kosovo conflict, once again, we connected ourselves with the KLA. Now, the KLA, it was known in 1998, the State Department had listed the KLA as a terrorist group. And I have, an, I have a, a quote here from um, Ralph Mutschk, who was Assistant Director of Interpol's Criminal Intelligence Directorate. And he testified before Congress in December 2000 that the KLA is suspected to be a terrorist organization. It was financing its operations with money from the international heroin trade and loans from Islamic countries and individuals, among them Osama bin Laden. He also confirmed that at least one elite KLA unit during the Kosovo conflict was arranged by Osama bin Laden and was headed by one of his top military commanders. There are many other reports to this effect in the public record, um, including sources in, in, in Bosnia itself. Albanian intelligence, for example, has confirmed that there is a huge presence of Mujahideen in the region um, connected to the KLA, which has now, of course, become the NLA and is involved in the conflict in Macedonia. And what did we do with the KLA? Before the war on Kosovo, as we know, as many reports confirm, we connected ourselves with the KLA quite directly. We were training them, we had training camps, we provided manuals, we provided a certain degree of military assistance. And unfortunately, we have good reason to believe that these people were often Mujahideen. There was interpenetration of people, operatives between Al-Qaeda and the KLA. There was interpenetration of finances, interpenetration of military assistance. And this had a direct impact on our national security, this involvement in the Balkans. I will quote again Yusuf Badansky, who talked about, he says, the role of the Albanian mafia, which is tightly connected to the KLA, is laundering money, providing technology, safe houses, and other support to terrorists within this country. This isn't to say that the Albanians themselves would carry out the actual terrorist operations, but there are sleeper agents within these Albanian networks, and they can rely upon those networks to provide them with support. A serious investigation of the Albanian mob in this country isn't going to happen because they're our boys, they're protected. In other words, the terrorists are protected. Now, one of the things I also did in relation to that was to try and draw connections between, before, before going on to the other regions, I tried to draw connections between these kind of liaisons and terrorist attacks. So I looked at the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, and I also looked at the 1998 US Embassy bombings. And again, I found disturbing reason to believe that this kind of connection had a direct impact in undermining our ability or willingness to deal with these terrorists who were quite directly involved with operations on US soil. Just to give you an idea, the mastermind of the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993, Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, kind of commonly known as the Blind Sheikh. This guy was basically, obviously, he was, um, he, he was involved deeply in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He was the guy who headed the, 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 the main Al-Qaeda cell in the United States that carried this out. What I discovered was that the Blind Sheikh was also deeply involved in recruiting Mujahideen, not just during the war in Afghanistan, but also for the Bosnian conflict. His refugees, Al Kifa Refugee Center, which was based in New York, Brooklyn, was originally, in, prior to the 1990s, was 
was uh, funneling finances and recruiting people to go and fight with the CIA um, in, the war to, in, in the war in Afghanistan to repel Soviet occupation. Many reports now confirm that in 1993, it switched its operations to Bosnia. Also, another organization connected to the Blind Sheikh called the Third World Relief Agency. According to many reports, including a report by the, the Senate Republican Party Committee, I believe, documented that this organization connected to the Blind Sheikh was also involved in funneling money to the Mujahideen in Bosnia and also recruiting more further Mujahideen to go and in, get involved in that conflict. So there's a very direct connection here. So what was the response to the Blind Sheikh? I mean, was there a kind of, was, did they know about his terrorist activities um, in relation to the World Trade Center bombing? Well, we know for a fact that the FBI had a great deal of information on what was being planned. They had a number of informants who had infiltrated the cell that uh, the Blind Sheikh headed. <coughs> Excuse me. One of these informants, his name was Imad, um, Imad Ali Sal Salam, I believe. Um, and um, so this guy was working for the FBI as an informant, and he was constantly wired. The FBI was c able to listen to everything that was going on within these cells. And this guy also kept very important records. He was recording of his own accord without the FBI even knowing many of these conversations. He was passing information to the FBI. And subsequently, in the, in the aftermath of those, of those bombings, when, they, when we found the, um, these, these recordings that he had made, and transcripts were made of these recordings, and they were filed in the court and so on and so forth, what we discovered was that he was actually integrally involved in the planning for the World Trade Center bombing. He was suggesting ways of, of carrying out the attacks. He was providing um, suggestions as to safe houses, warehouses. He even had a conversation with an FBI supervisor where he complained that, look, FBI was, the, was involved in constructing the bomb. And we messed up. And what are we going to do about this? And subsequently, we have also discovered the New York Times reported um, it was, it's well known, on one of the important um, conversations he also had, which indicates the extent of the precise, adv precise advanced warning that seemed to have been available to authorities. He complained that we had a plan. The FBI had hatched a plan to thwart the bombing. And the plan was this. Have the bomb set up inside the World Trade Center replace the bomb with a fake phony powder that won't work. And when it doesn't go off, then we can move in and we can capture these guys. Now, what happened, according to the New York Times, is that this was considered to be a bit too kind of like unrealistic. You know, there's no need to do this. Let's do something else. So they scrapped that plan, but nothing was done to replace this plan. And so the bomb went off. Now, the interesting thing is, I mean, I don't know precisely why. I'm not going to offer a theory of, of, of this very damning failure. But um, what I can say is that we know for a fact that the blind sheikh, long after the Cold War, up to at least 1993, was protected. When the, when the uh, rabbi Mir Kahain, the extremist rabbi, was shot and killed by a member of um, the blind sheikh's cell, and the FBI wanted to investigate, they were blocked. And the village voice, <clears throat> the village voice um, had a report where they quoted an FBI supervisor saying that, I'm very upset because I'm not able to, we, we haven't been able to investigate this guy. It seems like he's been protected by the State Department, by the INS, by the CIA. This, he is, he's one of our guys, and we're not allowed to look into this. And when they finally actually did investigate, they didn't, the, the investigation was, didn't go very far. What they did discover was boxes, huge boxes in his room. And these were only opened after the bombings occurred. And these, 
these boxes contained detailed plans for what was about to occur. Photographs of the World Trade Center, inflammatory statements about attacking Americans and attacking the West and so on and so forth. Details of the, of the individuals who are members of the cell. Why wasn't this box opened before the bombings? There was just no interest. So that pattern is the same pattern, I would argue, that occurred on 9-11. And it occurred in the 1998 US Embassy bombings. But before going into that, we'll have to go a bit more forward in history in terms of the connections that we had. Did we have connections, at the, in, you know, for example, during 1998 and during 1911 that may have in some way compromised our willingness to look at these people? Yes, we did. To this day, we have connections to states which are harboring al-Qaeda. I'll give you some examples. I mean, North Africa is, an ex is a, is a favourite for me because I'm personally interested in the region. I've researched it before in a professional capacity. Um, and I, I like talking about the example of Algeria. Now, Algeria is a state where there is a, a, a huge conflict, civil conflict going on between um, a secular government and a, a supposedly Islamic opposition. This Islamic opposition consists of a number of groups, some of them marginally legitimate but and politically orientated, and many of them are clearly terrorist groups. One of the most prominent is called the GIA, the Armed Islamic Group. And this group, we know for certain, is connected to Al-Qaeda. There's been a number of reports. I mean, the Center for Defense Information in Washington, D.C. has a, a whole lot of information on this. Excuse me, it's very well known. Unfortunately, there is information to believe that the same GIA, which is connected to Al-Qaeda, is also simultaneously infiltrated and penetrated by Algerian secret services. This was revealed early, last, early, early in, in, in the 20th century, in the 1990s, and throughout the 1990s, in the British press and the French press. Um, Algerian uh, secret service, services defectors came out and they said that we have information, we have read secret documents, we have been involved in operations which are basically hatched by Algerian military intelligence to manipulate and penetrate the GIA. Why are we doing this? Because we are fighting a war and to, to, to legitimize our policy, the militarization of our, of, our, of our domestic policy and state repression, we have to have this enemy. We have to escalate the conflict. And how much do, 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 does the, the United States and the West and Britain know about this policy? Because we're, we're, we are very friendly to Algeria. We have very close financial ties to this regime. Um, we are constantly giving uh, financial aid to the regime. We have very heavy investments there in terms of oil and gas. We are conducting numerous um, coextensive military programs in, with the regime, which I could go into, into detail to, but I, I won't do that here. Um, so how much do we know? Well, there were foreign office documents that were revealed a few years ago in a court trial in the UK about an Algerian guy who was supposed to be a terrorist. Now, 18 months late, the foreign office finally produced the documents, and they were very reluctant. And as a result of this, um, Jack Straw, Robin Cook, and I think um, another official in the government signed public interest immunity certificates because they were worried about what this would mean, this kind of revelation. What do these documents show? That the United States and Britain and Europe were well aware of this policy for years and that they were very worried about this kind of, the, the, the fact that they knew about this coming to light. And just to give you an idea of what some of these documents say, one of the documents said pretty clearly that you know, an MI6 guy is saying, we, we, we believe that the GIA has been, is being manipulated by Algerian secret services. We believe that the Algerian military will stop at absolutely nothing in pursuit of their uh, domestic objectives. And interestingly, a US intelligence report referred to the 1995 Paris bombings that was blamed on the GIA um, and which justified a huge counter-terrorist offensive within Algeria that was backed by the United States, by Britain, by France. And it said that we, there is no evidence to connect the Algerian militants to the 1995 Paris bombings. On the contrary, we have evidence to believe that at least one of the bombs 
was planned, planted, and the operation was directed by the Algerian military. So we know. And interestingly, one of the documents also says, from a Whitehall document says, that if this information comes out, that we are aware of this, we could be subjected to a lot of heavy questioning from journalists, from NGOs. We cannot afford to let this information come out. So clearly there is an element of complicity here because we are aiding and abetting an al-Qaeda terrorist group by financing its state sponsor. That is unfortunately what we are doing. Now, it's clear that there are a number of interests here. We have interest in oil and gas in Algeria, which seem to be cementing that relationship. Um, and the same pattern goes, uh, continues, to, continues in many other regions. Another prominent example is the Philippines, very relevant in relation to 9-11, because <coughs> excuse me, Abu Sayyaf, which is the domestic terrorist group there, the, the major Islamist terrorist group, is heavily connected to al-Qaeda and was also connected to 9-11 because Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the operational mastermind of 9-11, apparently, was a, was a leading member of, 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 of Abu Sayyaf. The, the, the main plot on 9-11 um, was inspired, was hatched in 1995 by Abu Sayyaf. It was um, called Project Bojinka. It was a plan. It had two dimensions. One dimension was to hide, was to was to take um, approximately 11 civilian planes and blow them up over the Pacific Ocean. The other dimension, I believe, was um, to hijack planes within the United States and to to fly them against key iconic structures, including the World Trade Center Tower, which was named the Sears Tower in Chicago, um, the Pentagon, the CIA headquarters, and many other structures. <coughs> Now, is there reason to believe that there is a similar phenomenon with the Abu Sayyaf? Well, a very prominent uh, Philippine politician by the name of Senator, Senator Pimilton, and this is just to give you one inch of the evidence that is available, he spoke out in, in, to the Philippine Senate, he gave a public address, and he said, I have evidence, I have sources telling me that the Philippine military intelligence has been coddling and controlling and manipulating the Abu Sayyaf in order, again, to legitimize the, to legitimize the militarization of domestic policy, to, to exacerbate the conflict. He cited, he named Philippine officials who were working at that time and said, we need to investigate these people. Nothing was done. Um, this has been corroborated by numerous reports um, conducted by Philippine journalists. Um, they've cited other people in the Philippine military who confirmed the same, um, and so on and so forth. Now, what is our relationship to the Philippine regime? Again, it's a very, very close relationship here. We are working on the ground with the Philippines. Um, the United States, for example, has troops working side by side with Philippine troops to the point that um, one U.S. major made a comment that we, are, we, you know, we have a co-director and a co-general for every operation. There is great assistance, in specific, for the counter-terrorist measures which the Philippine military is undertaking. So again, the question remains, this has been going on for years, how long has this been going on for? What do we know about it? We are clearly sponsoring, indirectly, through the state, an al-Qaeda group in order to secure certain interests in this region. Again, we can go on. I want to go back to North Africa because this is a favorite of mine coming from the UK. I want to talk about Libya. And this just gives you a very disturbing example of how far this kind of policy can go. <coughs> this was a scandal in the British press about, again, a few years ago. A guy by the name of David Shaler, who worked for about eight years for MI5 at the counterterrorism desk, you know, he came out. And he violated the Official Secrets Act in the UK to reveal that in 1996, the British government paid £100,000 to an Al-Qaeda cell in Libya. Why? To conduct a covert operation to assassinate Colonel Gaddafi. Now, is this a controversial issue? No, because it's, it's not subject to dispute anymore. The initial response of the government was to deny. Robin Cook, 
who was at that time Foreign Secretary, I believe, came out and said this is absolute pure fantasy. Two months later, the British government prosecuted David Shaler um, for violating, uh, for, for revealing national security secrets. And he did his time. He actually went to prison for that for, for a while and came out, but he's still working now. Now, so we know that this happened. So why did we do that? We connected ourselves with Al-Qaeda to pursue this aim. And it brings up a whole host of questions. I mean, what was this Al-Qaeda cell in Libya? The, the book called Forbidden Truth, which, written by the French, the, the famous book, which is a bestseller written by the French uh, intelligence experts, um, <coughs> they cited a number of sources revealing that one of the members of this cell was a man called Anas al-Libi. Now, Anas al-Libi is on the FBI's list of most wanted terrorists. He has several million dollars on his head. Now, this man, he's been, he, he was, he's been indicted as a conspirator in the 1998 U.S. Embassy bombings. Now, here we have a U.S. ally, the United Kingdom, paying him to conduct a covert operation. What is going on? Was there any remark by the United States government, you know, as to not, you know, this is, you know, was there any complaint? No, we have nothing on the record about any kind of protest about this, even when it came to light a few years later. Worse still, the British government was, was actually allowing this guy to live in the United Kingdom, according to The Guardian, until the year 2000, he was living in Manchester, living it up in Manchester, absolutely free, most wanted terrorist, and nobody did anything about it. So this raises a very important question. This is simply one isolated example. Given the pattern of relationships that we are establishing here, does this phenomenon happen elsewhere? Have there been other examples of us using Al Qaeda, apart from we know for a fact that we connected to, with co with, in terms of oper operationally in the Balkans, we know that we did this in North Africa, in Libya. Are there any other cases? Did this have a connection to what happened on 9/11? You know, and so this brings us more back. This brings us back to 9/11. I don't want to go into too much detail about the other examples. In my book, I talk about many other issues. I talk about. Um, Saudi Arabia um, and, the, and the kind of financial network there in relation to Al-Qaeda. I also talk about Pakistan and, and the crucial role of the ISI to this day in, in, in financing and military supporting Al-Qaeda um, and the fact that we are allied with, with Pakistan and that this is compromising completely this, you know, the stated objectives of the war on terror. Um, but I won't go into that. We can go straight back to 9-11. How does this impact 9-11? Well, clearly, if we are connecting ourselves with Al-Qaeda in the pursuit of our interests, whatever they are, strategic, economic, or humanitarian even, surely this is going to fundamentally undermine our national security because these people are receiving funds. They're receiving military aid, and that aid is fluid. Al-Qaeda is an international network. There is a movement across the globe of people, of ideology, of finances, of drugs, and of arms. And if we are constantly inputting into this, then how can we be fighting this war on terror? It fundamentally questions, challenges the war on terror as an entire paradigm. So, <clears throat> what do we do about this? Um, it's a big question. I think that it's important to call for disclosure we need to have some kind of disclosure on what is going on. There needs to be a renewed call for an investigation, not just into 9-11, but into our entire policy in relation to the Mujahideen and Al-Qaeda. Um, and I think this pro probably needs to be a new direction for us in terms of doing this. And one of the things I talk about in the book is, is the need to widen the picture, to recognize that this policy is that what happened on 9-11 is a product not just of specific, a specific administration, such as the Bush administration, or a specific group of people, or it's not just solely related to the neoconservatives. This is something which seems to have been going on for several years and has been common to both the Clinton administration, for example, and the Bush administration. So this is a cross-party problem. 
Arguably, it is a systemic problem. It has, it has something to do with the way the system operates. It clearly is bipartisan. Um, and so in that respect, we need some kind of investigation which is going to look not just at 9-11, but at previous terrorist attacks and at a whole range of foreign policies in relation to different states which have connections to Al-Qaeda. Um, so going back to 9-11, why did 9-11 how did 11 happen? I mean, I want to talk about some of the issues in relation to the intelligence failure in relation to, um, in relation to uh, the, 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 what actually happened on 9 the air defense failure. I mean, is it possible to draw connections between some of these liaisons that we have and between those failures? Well, clearly, we can draw a direct connection here to the intelligence failure. There was clearly very, a, great, excuse me, a great deal of reluctance to look at these people. Is it possible, for example, that the 9-11 hijackers had connections to these kind of liaisons that we had in different regions? We know, for example, there are many reports that the 9-11 hijackers um, received sec some kind of secure access, they, they, they sec security clearance um, to train at various US military installations. A number of reports to this effect came out in the aftermath of 9-11, one or two months afterwards, from the, um, the Defense Department and, and the U.S. Air Force that people like Mohammed Atta, Said Al-Ghamdi, uh, um, and, and many others, five to six, seven of the hijackers, had trained at various U.S. military installations. This was for after, uh, subsequently disputed by the same agencies that perhaps these aren't the same people. We have lists of names, um, but the official line was that the biographical data is not necessarily the same. Well... <clears throat> A journalist by the name of Daniel Hopsicker, who used to work with NBC and PBS, um, he decided to follow this up. So what he did, he contacted you know, the press department of the Air Force and the Department of Defense, and he pressed them, you know, look, you're saying that there's, there's biographical discrepancies here. Well, let's really push this. What about Mohammed Atta? Do you, was, it, was, was this guy who you have listed there the same age as Mohammed Atta, the terrorist? And the, and, and the official at the U.S. Air Force was, okay, yes, it's the same age. So he was like, well, you know, is it, do, what about other features? I mean, does he, does he have, well, is his name spelt the same way? You're saying that there's difference in, in, in name spellings. Yes, the name is, was spelt the same. So he was like, okay, can I get in contact with this other Muhammad Atta who, who's trained with you? You said that he's living somewhere in the United States. Can I contact him just to verify? I'm afraid I can't give you that kind of information. We need disclosure, I think, on, on these issues. Senator Bill Nelson was very worried about this. He, he was very worried in particular about, about the training that supposedly happened at Penascoda Air Force Base. He pushed Don Ashcroft's office to push the relevant uh, military agencies to find out about what was going on. After months and months of waiting, he was finally told by the FBI that they're trying to get through something complicated and difficult, and they could neither say yes or no. And to date, it's worth noting that no one officially has made a comment to resolve this issue, especially the 9-11 Commission. It's just been virtually ignored. Um, the most important point I can make on that respect is what Hopsiger subsequently did was to push the Department of Defense to give, a, to give an official response. And he recorded the statement that was made that I ha do not have the authority to tell you who trained at which um, at which schools, which seems to indicate that certainly somebody did train somewhere, but we don't know who. <coughs> so again, we need to push for disclosure of these issues, because this is clearly a national security problem. You know, if we are allowing these people to train at secure military installations, we have a problem for our national security. Um, so there are a number of these very direct issues which kind of indicate that if we, I mean, if we, if we look at the implications of this, if these people had some kind of connection to, to, to the U.S. military or to U.S. intelligence, does this explain the failure to obstruct their movements in the United States or the failure to pursue them? Perhaps it does. Again, I'm not offering a theoretical explanation. I don't know. It needs to be investigated. But clearly, there's a problem here. 
Now, moving on to the issue of, um, of more directly of the intelligence failure. Did we receive significant warnings of the event? Did we receive sufficient warning to act on, on, on prior to 9-11? I did a lot of research on this. Um, and the conclusion that I came to was that the depiction of this by the administration, by the 9-11 Commission, as an intelligence failure was simply not justified. In my, in my, my main argument, this was, this was not an intelligence failure. This was a political failure. I tried to look, using com completely open sources, public sources which I could trace reliably to US intelligence officials revealing information, I tried to trace the number of reports that were received about different issues, about methods, about targets, and about timing, to organize them in some coherent fashion and find out what was actually done with them. And consistently, it seems to be the case that these reports were not just ignored, they were taken seriously. To give you one kind of concrete example of this, there was a German intelligence report in um, a mainstream German newspaper, Frankfurter Zeitung Allgemein, I think is, is how it's pronounced. <coughs> and um, the report came a few days after 9-11. And they cited German intelligence officials basically saying that, well, Echelon, Echelon, which is the uh, international uh, network of satellites across the globe which monitors electronic communications, telephone, intercepts, faxes, emails, etc., etc. It monitors everything. That Echelon picked up information that first six months and then three months prior to 9-11, we, there was, we had uh, intelligence that Middle Eastern terrorists were planning um, to, to conduct exactly the kind of uh, terrorist operation that occurred on 9-11, to hijack civilian airplanes and target and hurl them as missiles against key symbols of American and Israeli culture. And what I found most significant about this report was that it specified, that officials have specified that this information was taken seriously by the US intelligence community and subsequently used to intensify surveillance. So the argument that this, you know, there was perhaps too much noise and, you know, Therefore, we weren't able to kind of make sense of the information or take it or take or consider it credible doesn't stand up. It was known that this kind of attack was being planned and it was known as to be taken seriously. And clearly, operations were done to, 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 to follow up and to see who was doing this. What can we do to prevent it? <coughs> Another favorite piece of information that I, I, I like to bring out um, because I think it really kind of highlights the issue, is um, David Shippers. Now, this isn't something new to the book. I actually discuss a lot of new information in the book, but I'll bring this out here because I think it's a very simple piece of information that, that demonstrates my point. And I interviewed David Shippers after hearing him. David Shippers, for your information, he was the chief investigative counsel who impeached um, Bill Clinton um, or, uh, and tried to impeach Bill Clinton. And um, what basically emerged from one of the radio interviews he did, um, which that brought me onto him, was that he, he had some contact with FBI agents prior to 9-11. And these agents were basically saying that they had information on some kind of attack and they were being blocked. And they were approaching him as someone with kind of, some kind of standing in the law enforcement community, kind of re public respect for what he did, um, to do something about it and use his connections. So I interviewed him on the telephone. And he said to me that he had several... Um, FBI agents, some of them from Chicago, some of them from elsewhere, who basically said to him that they knew that they, something was going to happen in Lower Manhattan. This was in May 2001. The wording they used was the financial arteries of Lower Manhattan. And they said that they had some specific information that Muhammad Atta, for example, was in their, was in their sites. Um, they, had, they had some of these people under surveillance and their investigations were being obstructed from Washington. I think one of the phrases they used was this, there was a short stopping of the flow of information from Washington, D.C. They were very concerned. So what did he do about this? He said to me that he called John Ashcroft's office to try and get them to 
because um, obviously this was this this is above the FBI to try and get the FBI to do something. He spoke to um, one of the one of the key rep leaders in, co in in Congress. I can't remember the name, <coughs> and and a couple of other officials. But he never got any response. For example, when he tried to get through to John Ashcroft, he only got through to an underling in the office. And the guy said to him, "Well, I'm sorry, I'll pass on your message to Ashcroft. But these investigations generally start from the top," um, which is kind of a put down. I mean, this is this is David Shippers. He's not a nobody. Um, so this was very strange, and subsequently Ashcroft never returned the call. Um, but that just gives you an example that this kind of information was clearly available in the community. But there was just not the willingness in Washington to deal with this. At some point, a political decision was made by various people to not deal with this specific issue of terrorism on US soil related to certain people carrying out this kind of Project Bojinka attack. I don't know why. I won't offer a theory again, but this is something that is clear. And one of the other pieces of information that I use to kind of highlight the extent of, of, of the information received is um, electronic intercepts that were made prior to 9-11. Again, it's interesting to know that one of the elements of the official narrative was that you know, after the 1998 US embassy bombings, we simply didn't have sufficient surveillance of electronic surveillance of Osama bin Laden because he, you know, he started to use human messengers and so on and so forth. <coughs> Again, there is reason to believe that this just isn't the case. Um, if I can find the uh, relevant reference, it would be helpful, but I can't seem to locate it. It doesn't matter. British intelligence produced a dossier that was quoted by Tony Blair. In this dossier, as may, as, as, this was like the white paper that Colin Powell referred to that never appeared in the United States but made its way to the UK. Um, and in this kind of white paper, what was, this was cited as evidence that bin Laden was involved in 9-11. And among the pieces of evidence that he cited was these electronic intercepts, surprisingly of Osama bin Laden himself having conversations with various people within Afghanistan, within Pakistan, and interestingly, one of the intercepts had Osama bin Laden warning people to get out of Afghanistan, of the, of, of the particular camps in Afghanistan, to move out of Pakistan, and saying that something is going to happen on the 10th... On, 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 sorry, no. This happened on the 10th September. He was given this information, and that something's going to happen very soon, so we have to move. Now, one of the kind of explanations of this is that has been put forward is that, well, this information wasn't translated in time to kind of to, 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 to do something about it. Now, there's reason to believe that this is not a sufficiently good explanation. One of the reasons I, I've referred to is um, a statement that was made by Senator Orrin Hatch on the day of 9-11, the Utah senator. He's a conservative Republican with wide contacts in the national security establishment. And interestingly, on the day of 9-11, he revealed to a number of news sources, CNN and others, that you know, the FBI and the CIA have received information from the NSA that we've just picked up members of Osama bin Laden celebrating the attacks. So we have good reason to believe that bin Laden was behind it. Now, the interesting, the important point here is that on the morning of 9-11, we had an attack. Within, that, within the few hours after that, we had people celebrating the attack in the United States. That was intercepted by the National Security Agency. Within a matter of hours, this information was, tran was intercepted, translated, and then disseminated to the CIA and the FBI, and then furthermore passed on to a member of the public, um, um, uh, the Senator Orrin Hatch, and was then furthermore passed to the public via the media. So that was very fast. So the idea that there was simply this, the logistical ability was not there to do this doesn't, doesn't work. This was not a structural, institutional, logistical problem. There was, this was a political problem. The willingness to deal with this issue, again, was not there. And I will close the discussion of the intelligence failure with, to, with, a, with a reference to a respected journal, Jane's Intelligence Digest. It's, you know, a respected uh, British intelligence journal, very well respected in, in, in the intelligence community and, and for, for official professionals working in the intelligence field. 
Um, and their conclusion several months after 9-11 was that there was an abundance of information available to the Bush administration, official, uh, information available from Russia, information available from a number of sources, but the Bush administration did not seem to have the political will to push the military into action. One of the issues that the, that the journal highlights is that the Bush administration reportedly had a number of opportunities to militarily neutralize Osama bin Laden in, in the years prior to 9-11, but there was no willingness to do that. And the, and, and the Digest simply questions that consistently there seems to be this, this, this lack of, of, of interest in following this up with concrete action. Um, <coughs> so how much was known? I will close that point with one quote. Newsweek, in the weeks after 9-11, reported twice. Pentagon officials had travel plans cancelled on 10th September for the next day over security concerns. This was reported by Newsweek. And Newsweek said, if this is the case, this is going to become a very big issue on Capitol Hill. And it needs to be. And it hasn't become an issue at all. Why did Pentagon officials have some kind of advanced warning or understanding, even if it was late, that something was going to happen on the day of 9-11? They took preventative measures to pre protect themselves, but nothing was done for the wider public. Why hasn't, hasn't the Commission addressed this issue? Why hasn't the government addressed this issue? Nobody has addressed this issue. Um, so I will close on that point and, and leave you with that it was very clear that decisions were made at the highest echelons to not deal with this issue. Why those decisions were made needs to be, needs to be disclosed in a real independent investigation, and this is, what this, this is what we need to call for, and this is what my book is about, essentially. Thank you very much, Nafis. Um, I was remiss in not introducing myself when I kicked off this uh, event. Uh, my name is Kyle Hentz, and I'm co-founder of 9-11 Citizens Watch uh, with my partner, John Judge, who is here for the town hall meeting. Um, the organizational sponsor for this town hall um, event uh, beyond Downing Street is uh, DC Emergency Truth Convergence. And that's a series of events that have been hosted here in DC these last few days. Uh, beginning yesterday, in fact, um, with a national press club uh, press conference, uh, continued uh, this morning with uh, a rally at uh, the White House, and uh, and furthermore, continue here at American University tonight, uh, this afternoon, and tomorrow. Um, and the focus is on seeing how we can come together as concerned citizens to connect the dots, see the pattern of deception, and work together to uh, bring the truth to light. Whether we're talking about um, uh, depleted uranium and the dangers to the troops and the people of Iraq, to um, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, uh, to the Downing Street memo and the, the false uh, pretext for war that got us into Iraq, uh, to 9-11. And uh, now I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Peter Phillips, who will then introduce some other guests here at the town hall meeting. Uh, Dr. Peter Phillips is the director of Project Censored, an internationally known media research program that annually identifies the most censored stories in the United States. The annual research book uh, produced by Project Censored is entitled Censored, the News That Didn't Make the News. So, Dr. Peter Phillips. We have a a group and on a panel here today and not everyone is up in front. First what we're going to do is accept questions um, to Nafiz Ahmed for about 15 minutes so that he can expand and you can ask specific questions. So I'll ask the group. We have a group of activists with a lot of different opinions about a lot of different issues around 9-11 and political orientations and a variety of things. For the questions to Mr. Ahmed, please, no speeches. I think I want to say that because this is our second day now of, of the 9-11 emergency truth convergence. And it's been very interesting, but there's been a lot of, lot of speech making and sometimes in opposition to each other. We really want to focus on, on his work. 
I'll introduce um, the members of our panel who, who are here. Uh, Ray McGovern, uh, right to my left, is a former CIA analyst and uh, has a chapter in the new book coming out, uh, Neocon, again, um, and uh, has another chapter called Patriotism, Democracy, and Common Sense, which is online at the Eisenhower Foundation. Next to him is Sonny Miller, who's the executive director of Trap Rock Peace Center and, um, in, in Deerfield, Massachusetts. Also joining us today is, is uh, Peter Dale Scott. Um, yeah, he's a professor emeritus, English department, UC Berkeley, and author of Drug, Oil, War, and the Uf U.S., Afghan, and Iraq, who's right here. And uh, Dr. Robert Bowman just joined us, too. So each of those former president uh, candidate and uh, longtime activists, each of, of these people will, will start out by giving, when we move to the um, town hall session part, we'll give a, a, a statement of five to ten minutes. And then anyone can respond, anyone can speak to issues of beyond Downing Street as three, and we're literally, there's 350 meetings similar to this around the country right now as we speak. Now we also got news um, today that um, Barbara Lee uh, from Oakland, a, a Democrat from Oakland, has introduced along with 22 other congressional members um, a House Republican, a House Bill 375 which is a resolution on inquiry on the Downing Street memos, which is a real first step to moving in the direction of, of coming to some of these answers. So thank you very much, Barbara Lee. I have a, a question for Ahmed. Um, the <clears throat> transition from the Cold War to a war on terrorism has served a, a purpose for continued military expansion and privatization of war. Halliburton, Carlisle Group, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, SAIC have all, are all benefiting from that in, in very large ways. Did the his, historical link between the CIA, Al-Qaeda, and ISI, this, ho this historical interconnectedness, serve to create the war on terrorism? It's pretty clear that um, the way, that, the way that, we've, that our governments have been operating in relation to Al-Qaeda has very much created the foundations of, of a war because unless we had involved ourselves to this degree, it's, it's, the question remains, what, what would be the power of Al-Qaeda? One of the interesting things that has come to light in, the, in my research is that Al-Qaeda is not, the conventional depiction of Al-Qaeda as an international non-state terrorist network is not correct. It's a multi-state sponsored terrorist network. That is pretty clear. It's sponsored by... I mean, we can be frank. It's sponsored by Saudi Arabia, elements of Saudi Arabia. It's sponsored by elements of, of, of the Pakistani ISI. It's sponsored by uh, elements of the Algerian regime, elements of the Philippines, ele elements of many other governments. Now, you have to excuse me. I keep taking cough sweets. It's because I've got a bit of a cold. So, but, um, so it seems to me pretty clear that if this kind of state-sponsored network did not exist in this manner, Al-Qaeda would not have the strength, the ability, the logistics, the, that logistical power to operate in, necessarily in the way it does, because there is clearly an influx of aid. There's an influx of military assistance. There's an influx of, 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 some, of this kind of intelligence support. Um, so it seems to me that this, this probably does make Al-Qaeda a more sophisticated and fluid organization across different state boundaries. Um, so in that respect, it's pretty clear that if we are also involved in this process by allying ourselves with these states and providing them with assistance, then we ultimately are aiding and abetting the same process. I mean, in a way, to give a kind of kind of shoddy example, it's like giving a murderer a knife. You know that the murderer is going to go and kill somebody, and yet you still give them the knife. And in that process, you almost become complicit in the crime. Um, so it's a very serious thing. I mean, obviously, quantifying the extent to which we have exacerbated this problem is difficult. Um, and you have to be careful about that. So one can't be sure. But I, be I believe that we have. <coughs> yeah. I'd like to ask a follow-up question to what you just said. 
Uh, it's, it's customary in this country to talk about Saudi Arabia as a failing state, and particularly Pakistan as a failing or failed state, because there's been a kind of fission at the top. The Saudi royal family has different factions. One faction has allied itself clearly with Al-Qaeda, with Al and we can identify Prince Turkey, who was the head of intelligence until mysteriously one week before this event he was fired. ISI, Musharraf now has identified enemies in ISI, starting with the head of ISI, Mahmoud Ahmed, who he fired one month after 9-11. Uh, and we see in there a problem at the top of these, of these states that the, one part of the state isn't controlling another. My question to you, do you ever think of America as possibly another example of a failed or failing state and that certain elements have been doing things which other parts of the state do not know about? Yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting analogy. Um, and I think it applies across the, across the board. I don't think it's, it's unique to the United States. It's very much a phenomenon in the UK. Um, it seems clear that there is an element of, of our government which is, which is very used to secrecy, is very used to doing things in secret and therefore doing things without any accountability. I mean, I, I go on and on. I keep going on and on about the Libya thing with Britain because, I mean, on the one hand, it's at home. Um, it's very relevant to me as a British citizen, but it, it really kind of makes so clear that, that what could be going on behind the scenes of which we, the public, are just unaware that our government could be paying an Al-Qaeda cell to do something and we just don't know about this. And it's only because some poor guy who then goes to jail who worked in the intelligence services tells us that we know about this. And, and I'm clearly worried that the executive branch in the United States clearly is op has been operating unaccountably for years um, and there are these connections there are these ties there are these there are these kind of this kind of sponsoring of these states which seem to be seem to have a very similar dimension to their policies um, and this is going on without any kind of accountability so the question is how do we deal with this how do we confront this kind of overarching secrecy and I think this the call for disclosure is very important that the fact that you cannot hide things on the pretext of national security when it is itself undermining national security you know this kind of policy whatever is behind it you know there seems to be some degree of deliberation in some quarters a, a certain degree of complete kind of absolute incompetence in other quarters but clearly the combination of this is undermining our national security systematically over 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 a decade or so um, and if that is the case, the pretext that we cannot reveal this information due to national security collapses. In the interest of national security, the national security apparatus needs to be deconstructed and looked into and investigated. I appreciate tremendously your linking all of these stories. We're familiar with um, the, the fear that these, uh, the lies that have been perpetrated are about legitimizing state repression here in the United States, but we haven't noticed, I haven't noticed, such an incredible similarity of pattern. Um, so it seems that you're saying basically that the militaries are beefing themselves up, and if you've got a bigger threat, you've got more juice, more money coming in to your system. In your uh, various countries that you've studied, is there um, clearly particular corporate interests that are benefiting in Libya, for example, or elsewhere? Well, going, well, if we're talking about North Africa, I'll talk about Algeria. Um, I mean, Algeria, there are so many American companies, for example, which are heavily have heavy investments in, in there. I mean, we have Exxon, Mobil, um, a number of other, I think there are six to seven uh, corporations related to oil and gas, which have investments there. And um, I have a list here, but I, I can't find it because of the mess that I've made of my papers. But um, so this is, it is very clear that there, there is a fundamental corporate dimension here. Um, and it's the same in Libya. I mean, now that, I mean, uh, interestingly, after this whole affair with Colonel Gaddafi possibly being assassinated, he seems to have got scared and he, he completely turned around. And now again, you know, we have the whole kind of, corporate system, the, the oil and the gas companies moving in, Britain as well, moving into Libya and, 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 and making friends with Gaddafi, who used to be our arch enemy. 
Um, and, and, and it's the same kind of process. Again, now, again, now we're connecting ourselves with somebody who we, we say is, is a terrorist. Um, so this process just goes on. And it's very clear that access to resources is a fundamental component objective of, of the policy. That's a very clear thing. And that in doing that, we are allying ourselves with people who are undermining our national security. And it seems clear to me that this policy is so systematic that policymakers are aware of the consequences of what is happening. Not necessarily all of them, but clearly elements of the policy-making establishment are aware, but yet it continues. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my question is this. It seems to me that the 9-11 truth movement uh, sustains two, two concepts at the same time. One of the concepts, of course, is that, that Al-Qaeda masterminded, as you put it, this 9-11 event, and that we allowed it to happen for what I think a lot of us in this room believe are obvious reasons. The other concept that we sustain is that we, of course, directly procured this event. Now, what I would like for yourself and maybe some others as this evening progresses to zero in on, because I'm not sure very much of this has been done, is to zero in on exactly how these two concepts coexist. I mean, it, it seems that we all are, tend to accept the image of an Osama bin Laden or an al-Qaeda that at least think they are carrying out an exercise against the United States. At the same time as there's a power structure in place, well, you say no, well, I, I, I mean, it seems to me we, we, we certainly entertain that concept. Okay, well, what I want to zero in on is this. How, how, do, how, does, how do the neoconservatives cooperate through Osama bin Laden or Al-Qaeda? How does it happen? How does it actually work? How, how does it, what makes Osama bin Laden, for example, think okay. that no rad's, no rad's going to stand down or that there are explosives, you know, deployed throughout these buildings that are going to make them come down? Okay. How, does, I, he, I how get, does he work with that? Yeah, I, get, I, do, I, I understand your, your question. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> of course, it's an important question. Um, but I think my approach is slightly different. I mean... To me, this is really almost an academic issue. I do have a personal opinion. Okay, I, I, have a, I do have a, I have a personal opinion, which I'm not going to talk about here. I don't see the relevance of me saying, well, I believe this and I believe that. What is important is getting to the facts. And the fact is this. We have, I mean, on the one hand, to, uh, to say that Al-Qaeda does not exist is to me a nonsense. This doesn't make any sense. It is a fact that Al-Qaeda was created during the Cold War and con continues to exist in some form. Okay, we can dispute what form. It's clear to me that the kind of hierarchical command and control structure is not, th that doesn't operate in that way, which may be conventionally described by our governments. Um, clearly, it is more kind of anomalous, it's more amorphous, it's a lot more looser and, and decentralized than, than is conventionally believed. Um, there is clearly, I mean, it draws its legitimacy from Islam, not that I would say it has any legitimacy in Islam, but it, in doing so, is Osama bin Laden clearly has a, a spiritual kind of figurehead status, and therefore you can see a, a reasonable kind of structure. So yes, Al-Qaeda does seem to exist in some form, and we do consistently ally ourselves with Al-Qaeda in many different ways, in these ways. Now, the question of, the, this is an important question, the question of, do you, are you a conspiracy theorist? Or are you a let it happen theorist? Or are you a incompetence theorist? Or are you a, you know, I'm not interested so much in the theory. You know, I think the theory is important in one level and we can discuss that. But the important thing is that we have certain procedures in place to do things in a normal way. We have laws which prevent us from doing things in another way. Now, on 9-11 and before 9-11, did we fail? to protect American lives? Did we effectively, you know, render our existing system inoperative in some way? My argument is yes, we did. We failed. The government failed us. The British government failed me recently. And Tony Blair has said, we don't want to have an inquiry into this because we have to find the roots of terrorism. Well, I'm sorry, but if we, we, are, if we don't know why we failed to protect ourselves, what is the point in going on with this war, invading Iraq and killing 100,000 civilians? It doesn't make any sense. We start at home. You know, we have to start at home. So this is my point. 
and I really believe the 9-11 movement has to get its socks up on this issue, you know. People complaining that, um, you know, I don't believe, you, know, you don't believe that, that there was a no plane at the Pentagon? I'm sorry, you're a traitor. Or, I, you know, I believe this. And No, why are we discussing these issues? You know, we, it's legitimate to hold your opinion. It's legitimate to have these discussions and these debates. And I think anything is open to discussion. But this is what we agree on, you know, whether you're a conspiracy theorist supposedly, or a co coincidence theorist, we can unite on this point that clearly the government failed. The government failed us, and we need to understand, we need to have a disclosure, we need to have an investigation onto why they failed. And these people who failed us need to get out of office, because they do not belong there. They do not belong there. They should be impeached, in jail, whatever. Blair, Bush, the whole team, they failed us, and they, they, are resp they need to be held accountable. That is what counts. And that is what we should be calling for. Uh, just this past week, the Indian Prime Minister was here in um, America, and America uh, went against long-standing beliefs to not allow the sale of nuclear weapons or nuclear technologies to countries who do not allow a full and complete inspection of their programs. Could we, in fact, with the expansion of American war to mean preemptive war, to mean we can hit them if we think they're thinking about hitting us, and, you know, it's actually aggression, can we now figure that this policy of allowing nuclear proliferation to the Indian government has a means of a counterbalance? Your policy studies, man, is that how they're trying to counterbalance the Hindus against the Islamists, uh, your comments on that policy decision. Well, this is one of the, one of the wor things that worries me, is if you look at the wider geopolitics of the war on terror, I mean, much of the, much of the actual strategy of the war on terror seemed to have been in place several years before 9-11. I mean, one of the most obvious documents that suggests that is the Project for the New American Century, which is well known, and the kind of the layout of the plan to go into Iraq and so on and so forth. And this was, of course supported and project for the American Century, of course, neoconservative think tank with ties to, to, to members of the Bush administration, such as Dick Cheney, Rumsfeld, and so on and so forth. So clearly, the strategy was there. Um, what worries me is that in terms of the specific issue of preemptive warfare, um, <clears throat> I mean, there are a number of very critical factors here which seem to be instrumental in, in driving Western foreign policies. Um, among them, of course, is the issue of resources. Um, there are many issues in relation to accessing energy, oil, gas. Um, and there are these issues, I believe, are being exacerbated by the problem of energy depletion. I mean, there are a number of studies, a number of studies. I think, I believe there is a virtual consensus in the oil industry community that oil, the um, world oil, the, the production of world oil has peaked, either has peaked or will peak within the next few years. Um, and how do we know, how, the American government we know has taken this into account. I mean, the James Baker Institute for Public Policy was commissioned by Dick Cheney to do a study. This was before 9-11, I think in the year 2000, summer of 2000. And in that report, there was a lot of discussion of, of the, pros, pro, the possibility of, of, a, of a coming oil crisis due to the problem of world oil production. Um, and, and interestingly, it pinpointed Iraq as a key issue and a key issue to be resolved in relation to this crisis. Um, so it's pretty clear that there is an energy problem here in the making. Um, on the other hand, of course, the issue of energy conflict also raises the problem of competing world powers. Um, and let's not forget that this is occurring within the context of a system which is plagued by growing ecological and environmental problems. We have projections from the scientific community now that within, within a decade or so, we are going to have very severe problems with climate change. <coughs> I mean, just to summarize the issue, what we, we are, we're facing multiple global problems here, which are all kind of coalescing. And within this, this kind of crumbling system, we have the United States government, the British government, 
the Russian government, the Chinese government, all of us, all of these governments trying to think of strategies by which to maintain and secure their interests within this, this system. And the United States government has come up with this policy of preemptive warfare, clearly in, the, in, in, in projecting the possibility that there is going to come a time when these issues may at some point coalesce into the possibility of nuclear war. I mean, we just have to look at the Middle East and, and the potential for nuclear Armageddon in the Middle East in the Israel-Palestine conflict, um, which is very worrying. We have to look at North Korea and, and Iran and Pakistan and these kind of, you know, this is a very real problem. Um, and this is why I believe the United States government has adopted this policy because there is this, there is this very real problem. And I think in terms of the wider 9-11 movement, these issues need to be taken into account. That 9-11 truth is not just about 9-11 truth, it's not just about the United States, it's about the entire world and the way in which the, 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 the trajectory of our policy and the trajectory of the international system today, which is fundamentally compromising human life, not just now, but in, within, within the next few decades. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Nafis, thank you for your extraordinary work. Um, I'm concerned about um, your unwillingness or inability to make certain conclusions. You mentioned about the CIA, like mysteriously the United States government might be making some mistake of supporting al-Qaeda. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the three-hour special, The Power of Nightmares from BBC, which indicates clearly that the CIA created al-Qaeda and continues to support it. That's one thing. So I appreciate your comments on that. But uh, more importantly, you indicate that 9-11 was not an intelligence failure, but a political failure. This is not a political failure. Abundance of evidence suggests that this was a crime that the United States was absolutely complicit in. And, and, it's, it's in t and you say, well, what can we do? Well, in Los Angeles, uh, what we have done in Los Angeles is we had a citizen's grand jury uh, because none of the um, investigations, including the commission, uh, which you uh, sort of act like it's a mystery that they didn't handle certain information. It was essentially a whitewash commission, and none of the investigations, the Senate, the, uh, the dossier out of England, um, the 9-11 uh, commission, any of these, uh, they were committed that none of them challenged the official story of 9-11. None of them were willing to um, use as their mandate uh, the creation of any accountability uh, or to establish legal responsibility for anything that happened on 9-11. This is profoundly important, and it's we the people that need to reclaim responsibility, which is why this gathering, and why I'm thrilled that your book came out. The problem here is that uh, we need to, to really state very clearly that this was not uh, an accident that happened to us, an attack that happened to us. It was a crime that happened in the United States of America that we need to be responsible for. And it's obvious when you speak about the 19 hijackers, uh, that whole thing is a myth. What we know about the 19 hijackers is that at least nine of them are still alive, that none of their names were on the flight manifest list, none of the, no evidence of them, of their bodies dying. Is there a question? Yes. Well, my my question is, uh, you seem to, to uh, in your first book, which was wonderful, War on Freedom, you tend to, to suggest that the United States government was willing or somehow let 9-11 uh, happen. Um, and now you seem to be backpedaling. And rather than seeing it, it was clearly a pretext for war on the neocon agenda uh, that, that was outlined in the project of the New American Century. You seem to kind of be suggesting, man, we, we have sort of a strange policy uh, that when in fact, what we know, one last thing, is on uh, the Could Pentagon. The question, sure, please? sure. The Pentagon, three days prior, uh, we have satellite photos showing what is the, the trajectory. Question, please, Lynn? Yeah, the tra trajectory of whatever the object is that went into the Pentagon. We have tremendous evidence that this government, okay. you know, was okay. complicit get, in this. I get your question. Okay, I, thank I do you. get your I question. Mean, there's a series of questions. Yeah. You know, okay. I, I mean, the there's too many questions to deal I with. I'll deal with the main one. Okay. The first, which is basically, have I changed my position, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, have I, you know, basically, my personal position hasn't changed, but my tactical position has. My, my tactical position has, and the tactic simply is this, that why deal with, 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 con with conflicting theories when you can deal with facts? Now, when I talk about, for example, I mean, 
you you ascribe to me this kind of like you know mysterious. I've I've just I've said the commission mysteriously didn't deal with certain issues. Well, I never used the term mysteriously. I said they they didn't, which is a clear difference. They didn't, and I didn't get the opportunity to describe why. Clearly, the commission was a whitewash, absolutely. And I really appreciate you coming and clarifying that it wasn't just a political failure; it was a crime. Yes, because if you violate statutory obligation, it's a crime. You see, and these and in if you if you fa this was if you failed in this way, it's a crime. It's, a, it's you know, and you can be impeached for doing that. Now, you're, you're, what you're basically saying is that we need to basically make a position and the position needs to be either that the government let it happen or the government made it happen and what i'm saying is that i'm constant i'm doing something actually very different i'm not dis i'm not saying what you're saying is wrong and what i'm saying is is that we have facts and now you don't have to say i believe the government let it happen because i've found that when i go if you go around saying that peop many people will automatically turn off and they won't appreciate what you're saying. And what I'm saying is that for unity on this issue, it's much more important to focus on what we know. And to say, for example, that the Pentagon had information, they clearly had information that something was going to happen on 9-11. They clearly, I mean, it, they had precise advance warning. That is a thesis of my book. They had clear information on, on the method. They had clear information on the targets. They had clear information on the date. Um, and of course, the question is, why did they fail? Now, what I'm doing is asking the question, and I'm not giving you an answer because I don't think there is any value in me coming out and saying this is the answer because many people have different interpretations of what happened. And I think giving an answer like that can often be divisive. And can, what, I mean, the point is, we're calling for an investigation. Why do we need to give an answer before the investigation occurs? You see what I'm saying? So the point is, all I'm saying is, we have connected ourselves with Al-Qaeda. I'm not saying it happened accidentally. By all means, I don't think it happened accidentally. We did not accidentally start connecting ourselves with the Mujahideen in Bosnia or the KLA. There was a very clear policy decision made. And it's pretty clear to me that policymakers are aware of the ramifications of this, that we are connecting ourselves with these people, that this has a direct impact on our national security. Now. I could go further, you know, but I, I just don't think tactically it makes sense to go around saying that, to go around making a position that we need to adopt this position, otherwise you're doing wrong. I think that is very detrimental for the movement. So, uh, one specifically, I mean, when you talk about the hijackers, you act about the, about the 19 are legitimate when we know they're still alive. So I'm wondering how come you're not dealing with those facts as well? Well, there's, yeah, I mean, it was one report that I, I didn't mention. I mean, the, the, there, was, I mean, there was a number of reports that the BBC said that some of these hijackers seem to be alive. Um, that, was just, that was just something I didn't mention. My focus was on what happened prior to 9-11 with the hijackers in terms of their apparent military training and so on and so forth. Um, so that was why I didn't discuss that. <laughs> Possibly. There, there, could, there are many other ways of... Have a little response. I was asked to introduce myself. I'm John Judge. I'm the co-founder of 9-11 Citizens Watch, and I helped Cynthia McKinney organize the briefing yesterday. And uh, I'm going to spare you my question in the sake of time. We have to quit. It was about strategy of tension. It's too long to go into. Google it. Um, I just want to support one of the points you made. Martin Schatz, in his book, History Will Not Absolve Us, says that the political paralysis in America is due to the fact that we are allowed to believe anything but to know nothing. And as long as our history and our current events are a commodity of the national security state and a corporate-controlled media, we cannot move forward. And we will devolve into exactly these kind of debates based on speculation instead of fact. This report is worse than the Warren Report. At least the Warren Report released 8,000 pages and 26 volumes of its hearings and its evidence so it could be compared to its faulty conclusions. Every single footnote of this report relates to a document or an interview that you cannot see that is locked up into the National Archives till January 2nd, 2009, when President Bush can reverse the decision and keep it longer. 
And that, I think, should be one of the main focuses, is to end this secrecy and release this material, release the films, the forensic data, the black boxes, release the interviews and the records. We've done an FOIA through National Security Archive on every single document mentioned, and every single one was turned down. That is a democratic fight for your own history. Make it. Nafiz Mossadegh Ahmed is executive director of the Institute for Policy Research and Development, based in Brighton, England. The War on Truth is published by Olive Branch Press, an imprint of Interlink Books. For more information, visit interlinkbooks.com.